Okay. Well, then uh, uh, we can guess we can get started then. Um, to anyone who's just shown up, uh, I'm uh, Jason Levin Koopman. Uh, I'll be chairing this session. Uh, I'm from uh, 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 Wageningen Economic Research in in the Netherlands, and uh, um, uh, thanks to uh, Imam uh, Hakiki who, who will be uh, hosting the session and uh, also giving um, giving the, uh, the 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 time warnings. Uh, uh, I expect to the uh, to the speakers. So everyone has um, twenty minutes to to present, and we'll give be given it a two minute warning. And approaching that time, followed by um, ten minutes of uh, discussion before moving on to the next speaker. We have uh, four speakers here in this session, which is on water and agricultural policies. Um, we have. Um, we have uh, Jing Liu, uh, research economist at the Center for Global Trade Analysis, Purdue University. She will be speaking on uh, evaluating alternative options for managing nitrogen losses from U.S. corn production. And the next speaker will be uh, Benedetto Falsetti, uh, PhD student from uh, Polytechnic University of Turin in Italy. Um, she will be speaking on uh, the impact of the implementation of the African continental free trade area on virtual water trade flows. Uh, following that uh, presentation, we'll have uh, Lee Humphreys, uh, an economist at the Department of Environmental Food and Rural Affairs in the United Kingdom. And he'll be giving a presentation uh, assessing the impact of dual production systems on agri-food trade and trade policy. And then finally, we'll have uh, Shweta um, Adikari, um, a uh, graduate research assistant at the University of Georgia, and her presentation will be on the impacts of the Sino-U.S. trade war on major cotton exporting and importing economies. So, uh, Jing, if you would, uh, if you would load your presentation and uh, begin. Oh, Thank you, Jason. Other, uh, sorry, well, one one more uh, quick thing is uh, everyone just to make sure that I see everybody's muted already. It's very good, but uh, just a, a reminder to keep keep yourself muted um, when you're not speaking. And uh, questions, you can write your questions in, in in the chat, and I will be reading them. Then uh, when it's time for discussion. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Jing. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, yeah, hello everyone. I'm Jing Liu. So I'm presenting today an uh, application about uh, nutrient management practices in the US, especially in the corn production area. Um, this is the amazing team I've been working with. <laughs> and uh, they come from Purdue University, uh, um, Wisconsin Medicine, and University of British uh, Columbia. So the background of this study is the uh, why the intensive use of uh, nitrogen fertilizer in agriculture, um, particularly from the corn belt and the excessive uh, nutrient that goes to the Gulf of Mexico and form this dye zone, and that is causing a lot of problems for fishing and the tourism. And then the size of the dead zone varies across years, but uh, it has been uh, pretty high last five years in um, particularly the 20. Uh, 17, and then the um, goal for the um, task force of uh, um, uh, hypoxia is to re reduce the total nitrogen loading in the Gulf of Mexico by uh, 45%. Uh, uh, so this is the uh, goal where to reduce the uh, size of the dead zone to a uh, manageable area. And um, to achieve that goal, a variety of uh, conservation practices have been um, proposed. Uh, this varies from some in-field practices like uh, uh, site dressing and splitting your nitrogen fertilizer application between fall and spring season to some uh, out of uh, out of edge practices like uh, wetlands and controlled drainage, and to um, the even more effective practices like just retiring the land from production, and the 
average reduction also varies from like 10% up to uh, 40 or 50%, depending on which practices is adopted. Um, so uh, how, how do we uh, approach this uh, question of uh, managing, comparing different uh, conservation practices is to um, design different policies, like um, I listed here as A, B, C, D. Uh, the first one is to uh, implement a fertilizer tax to increase the cost of using fertilizer. And then here we consider 100% uh, of uh, nitrogen fertilizer tax uh, add up to the uh, national fertilizer cost price. And then the second policy we consider is to using like set dressing or other nutrient management practices to increase the productivity of nitrogen fertilizer. So you don't have to really cut off the application rate, but uh, um, the more efficient use of the nutrient will um, make farmers don't need to use the, that much fertilizer and to achieve the same amount of outputs. And then um, policy C and D will correspond to the on the edge practices. Here we focus on control drainage and wetland. Those two have been widely adopted in the Corn Belt and uh, have been sh shown by the literature as the mo almost the one of the uh, most uh, effective nitrogen management practices. Then at the end, we tax some combination of these policies to see what if they are accumulated, uh, the largest amount of uh, um, nitrogen reduction would be. And then we're interested in uh, like where the total mitigation will be uh, given by each policy and what is the spatial pattern of leaching reduction at the local level. And then uh, to by comparing those policies, we kind of, uh, um, Tease out the most optimal strategies at a local and um, state level, and then we show to achieve a certain amount of uh, mitigation goal where we should target. And then uh, our model is able to show some very interesting special uh, spillover effect due to the targeted policies. Um, so the first two policy actually uh, very straightforward is uh, implemented uh, right through the model and it's uh, uh, nationwide uh, nationwide policies but the uh, control drainage of wetland is restricted to the feasibility of the practices so which was provided by our collaborators and they uh, told us where uh, it is feasible to uh, implement those practices because um, the uh, soil condition uh, varies and also um, the cropland intensity varies. And then these maps showing uh, on average the leaching removal rate by uh, adopting those practices. So you can see for control drainage, it's about 20 to 30 percent here in, in the Corn Belt, and then the wetland could be even more effective in the west side of the Corn Belt. So these will be uh, forming our shocks in the model to uh, reducing the uh, nutrient management at the gray cell level. And the modeling framework, so we adopted, uh, uh, recently adopted uh, development um, Simple G model. So Iman who is hosting the session, uh, lead the work. So the paper was published the last year. It's a graded uh, partial um, equilibrium model. But for this project, we uh, develop a special version of the Simple G. We call it Simple G US CS. CS is for corn and soy. So you know the model focusing focusing on only two crops corn and soy because the corn is the the most intensively using fertilizer crop and then some special feature of this model is we included uh, 
nitrogen leaching module to connect the uh, leaching management policies to the mitigation outcomes. And then finally, we have uh, a, a few um, grid specific parameters that are either estimated uh, statistically using the grid cell level data uh, or um, uh, it is uh, calibrated using some um, output from uh, e uh, agro ecosystem model called agro ibis so uh, basically we have a leaching function that is a quadratic form and we have some elasticity of substitution between land and other input also we have estimated the land supply elasticity that tells us uh, um, if there are any special spillovers or to the land targeted regions so here uh, is a, a schematic showing the main structure of the model from the supply side. So we do have the uh, uh, breakup of uh, irrigated and rain fed crops. And then this is a pretty typical CES uh, function it has been used a lot of the uh, amount of uh, equilibrium models. So. Um, for the irrigated crop, we have water and land at the bottom and uh, aggregate up to uh, water and land uh, composite and then combined with other inputs into uh, augmented land inputs. And then furthermore, uh, we add fertilizer at the top layer to produce the final irrigated uh, crop. And for each layer, we have this um, Elasticity of substitution governing the substitutability between two inputs. And then uh, on the rain fed side is pretty similar, but just the um, water is not used. And then uh, here uh, we have some special beauty in uh, additional data from the external sources, like feeding into the uh, base data, like here is the nitrogen fertilizer use. Um, in the U.S., we see uh, relatively higher in the main uh, corn belt area. Um, and then we have this leaching function tell us uh, how much uh, fertilizer use could be leaching to the stream. And then it, it differs between irrigated and rain fed crops, but uh, on average, it's about 20 to 40 percent of uh, uh, for that the use that will be lost in the water. And then we have this cropland supply elasticity. So uh, you see uh, more elasticity or land expansion potentials, not in the uh, major corn belt area, but on the fridge of the corn belt. And then finally, uh, we use the agro ibis output to estimate this uh, uh, lens, uh, the elasticity of substitution between nitrogen and other inputs. Uh, also, it varies between rain fed and the irrigated crop. Well, um, so how exactly the leaching model work to connect those policies to our mitigation outcomes? Here I um, use some examples, um, like in this chart, here you have the leaching curves as a quadratic function and we have a yield response as a compass function and then so uh, for policy a which is only reducing the nitrogen use is cutting off the nitrogen rate so basically just using less fertilizer so the consequence will be um, it could be reducing the yield uh, depending on where the farm sitting on this curve it could be sharp reducing it could be very moderate reducing and then uh, but the nitrogen loss uh, is like they, uh, for this particular farm uh, when you reducing the nitrogen application rate from 150 to 110 it doesn't really affect the yield much but reduce the leaching quite a lot so we have basically this kind of curve for each grid cell. So we would know for a certain percent of uh, um, fertilizer use reduction, how, how much nitrogen leaching would achieve. And then um, the second policy, like 
to increase the fertilizer use efficiency, um, it doesn't reduce the um, fertilizer use amount, but kind of shifting those curves uh, uh, up and down, like uh, to so that the farmer use the same amount of uh, nitrogen, but the uh, output and leaching will be different. And then um, for the policy control drainage and wetland restoration, um, it doesn't really affect uh, the fertilizer use, but it's shifting this uh, leaching curve downward. So for the same amount of fertilizer use, the leaching loss will be less. So it, uh, in the model, I will just uh, um, uh, add a gesture to the original leaching rate. So the total leaching, uh, which combines the leaching rate and the area will be lower after it is adjusted by this removal rate. Um, and the, the policy will be um, played out through this leaching intensity. Uh, of course, the policy, like the tax, doesn't vary by gray cell, but the leaching intensity varies by gray cell. So eventually, it gives uh, uh, great specific outcomes. So look at some results. The first one we found is the tone mitigation given by different uh, strategies, like from the rate reduction to the uh, wetland restoration. So the total reduction is about eight to uh, 16 percent but if you uh, combine some of them like uh, in scenario um, of combining uh, a b and d so the rate reduction nutrient management plus some white land restoration that could be uh, implemented simultaneously that gives it you about 31 percent of the re total reduction the um, amount of fertilizer use is not affected uh, uh, a lot, about 5% to 10%. And um, the impact on output is only minimum. So uh, it doesn't really affect the uh, crop output. And then uh, this, so this is the like a national total mitigation, but at the grid cell level, because we're doing this fine scale modeling, we can show at very uh, specific location what the mitigation will be. And this red color just to show some spillover effect because um, um, you're not targeting those area and those area will take advantage of some response to the market at the macro level to uh, uh, make some different production decisions. And then um, because we we know the um, risk cell specific reduction in each of these individual policies and by comparing them, we can uh, find the, the practice that gives the largest amount of mitigation and the call it the most effective single policies among the four. And then uh, we uh, draw this map uh, showing if um, the policy could be adopted at the cell level, what it could be. So uh, in a corn belt, it's mainly controlled drainage or wildland story, but on the edge, it could be nutrient management on the west side and the leaching tax in the eastern side. Well, of course, the policies uh, is not practical to be implemented at the grid cell level, but more likely to be state level. So um, here we compare the amount of total mitigation across strategies and by state. So you will see here some practices like a wetland will be almost the most effective one for these states, but control drainage will be most effective in Indiana and uh, Ohio. So that means if, uh, for the state, if they want to pick the most uh, uh, successful uh, practices, that could be very across the states. Um, and then uh, we find uh, actually this uh, 45 uh, 
amount, 45% of uh, total mitigation. Uh, it's, it's a lot, but it's quite concentrated in a uh, small amount of grid cells. Like we show here, this is the accumulator for grid cells, and this is the accumulation of the total mitigation. So this is the half, uh, so the 50% of the mitigation. Um, and actually, um, for the policies A and B, about 10% of the grid cells is contributing those 50% of mitigation. And the number of grid cells is even smaller for uh, the other two policies, control drainage and wetland. That means if you really work very hard on this, um, like 10%, 7% of grid cells, that will help you achieve almost half of the total um, um, goals. So that could be very efficient. Well, um, uh, to, sum, to sum up, so we find um, to achieve this 45 reduction goal, not a single mitigation strategy alone will be working. So it has to be combined, uh, multiple uh, uh, conservation practices to, be, to get there. And we find some very special, uh, very interesting uh, spatial pattern of leaching reduction. So even though some of them give the total amount of uh, mitigation at the national level, but at the grid cell level, the pattern does vary. And uh, the most effective strategies will be different by location and by state. So from the policy point of view, uh, uh, it should uh, think about for the local, should think about the different policies that suit their condition best. And then, uh, we show this uh, market mediation effect that will give some spillover uh, outcomes in the non-targeted region. Uh, I don't know what is that. And then, uh, then, then uh, finally, targeting is the key. So we show um, those policies if we uh, focusing on some very leaching land, it could give you very uh, effective uh, reduction outcomes. Well, um, I will uh, stop here and uh, open up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jing, for that great presentation. Um, Anyone has any uh, immediate questions? Uh, you can write write it in the chat, um, or uh, see that no one has written in the chat yet. And it take, usually takes a moment. If someone's jumping, they can uh, just turn their camera on and maybe say something. Real quick. Yeah, yeah. People also need a moment to to get their the thoughts together. I had. Um, I had a, had a question about the, the um, heterogeneous uh, market mechanisms, and because uh, you, you said that um, that you are focusing on uh, corn and soy as opposed to the standard simple G uh, model, and I was wondering if maybe you could um, say a few words, or even just speculate about how that might uh, change the, uh, the market. The, uh, the market spillovers if you were to include uh, other other crops uh, in the model or versus just focusing on uh, corn and soy? Um, I think the market mediation uh, um, has less to do with uh, crop composition. Uh, here we pick the two crops, corn and soy, because corn is almost the most uh, the largest uh, nitrogen fertilizer consumer, and soybeans is just uh, a crop rotates with corn uh, every year. So um, the market mitigation effect actually comes from this uh, local to global response. So um, when the local respond to some macro level policies heterogeneously, and then uh, their response when aggregated back to the market, there will be an effect to the market price. So the prices, the commodity prices, uh, actually uniform uh, nationwide. 
So, um, so even though you see this uh, red area, they are not directly uh, affected by the policies sometimes. So uh, we don't have the control drainage or wetland dependent directly in this area, but they are uh, affected by the corn price. So if these farmers produce less and the corn price goes up, and but these farmers, they kind of uh, will have to invest in this control drainage or wetland. So they, they sort of losing some uh, um, advantage on the market, but the, the farmers on the edge, they don't invest in those uh, uh, facilities and infrastructures. And so they're taking advantage of the higher commodity prices. So they got produce more and uh, that could be the spillover and they produce more and they will leach more. This, uh, um, so this market mediation effect uh, uh, comes from the, the global to local to global response. Thank you for that question. That gives me an opportunity to explain uh, <laughs> the, our main approach. Like we, we call it GLG, the global to local to global. <laughs> All right. Are there yeah, any um, other questions? There are. Well, there are two questions which are hitting this very same theme. So I think we're we're on the, certainly on the right track here. Uh, uh, Iman, I'll, I'll, I'll read them both so you can sort of try to answer them both. So uh, Iman uh, says, uh, uh, "Great talk. Um, did you look at the spillover effects to other countries?" So that's hitting on this same theme. And uh, Mike Bourne. Uh, right, so thank you for this presentation. Very interesting. Do you know if similar approaches have been applied to other countries or regions of the world? Mm. Iman, so <laughs> Iman has been, I think Iman should be know every piece of this uh, modeling framework. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, we haven't, I haven't looked at that uh, to the other countries yet, uh, but given like uh, uh, the overall um, output impact is quite small, and I guess for the U.S., I guess the uh, price impact probably will be small too. So, um, yeah, I will look at the to uh, how it affects the other countries, but my guess would uh, would be uh, it shouldn't be large in this uh, case. But that's a good suggestion. I never think about that because <laughs> uh, this is totally implemented within the United States. Uh, um, but it could be an interesting story uh, if put it in a global context. Thank you for that. And uh, to uh, address another question from Mike. Um, yes, you're uh, thinking ahead actually. <laughs> we are indeed doing something similar. So. Uh, if you um, notice, like uh, we, how we name our models, like uh, simple G, US, CS, we do have uh, a couple more simple G new members coming to the family. Uh, another one is simple G China. So uh, that was founded by another my NSF project uh, to study the infuse system between US and China. So in that project, we are uh, building a simple G China model. So basically break, it, break up China into more than uh, 88,000 grid cells. And then uh, we are using that model to study the uh, south to north water transfer project in China, as well as uh, gray to green program, the conservation programs in China. So uh, one of my students who presented the paper yesterday about the water transfer project, and then uh, we're working on the manuscript and trying to tease out some final findings. And another uh, uh, initiative we just started is to construct a simple G Brazil model. So uh, we're uh, still at the stage of collecting data and building the model, but uh, this is uh, uh, 
very good question. And then uh, we are doing something exactly for the other uh, countries as well. Okay. Um... If there are no other questions, I'd like to thank uh, Jing one more time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. Yeah. Uh, and um, Bene uh, Benedetta Falsetti is next. You can go ahead and put up your presentation. Um, Benedetta Falsetti is um, a PhD student from the uh, Polytechnic University of Turin, and she will be giving a presentation on the impact of the implementation of the African continental free trade area on virtual water trade flows. Okay, can, can you see the screen? Yes. So, hi everybody. Uh, yeah, I am a, a PhD student at Politecnico di Torino, and uh, I will present the work that me and my supervisor are developing with Jason and with Katrin Carrico from Wageningen Economic Research Institute. Uh, so, briefly, we investigate the impact uh, of the implementation uh, of the African Continental Free Day Trade Area on virtual water flows. Virtual water flow, virtual water is namely the volume of fresh water used in the cultivation, production, uh, or trade stages. In fact, through the network of international trade in agricultural goods, water resources uh, are virt virtually transferred from the country of production to the country of consumption. So for the purpose of this study, we grouped the countries under 17 regions, and this regional aggregation mainly refers to the economic agreement existing in Africa, as well as uh, major external partners, trading partners. And to exemplify the consequence of the uh, implementation uh, of the policy implementation in terms of virtual water for agricultural trade, we focus on Burkina Faso's case. Uh, in fact, Burkina Faso is shown in the map as a single state in the African continent, and uh, Burkina Faso's agricultural sector contributes uh, to 30% of its GDP and is the main source of income for the rural population. So, uh, in order to take into account uh, the primary products, we consider uh, eight agricultural sectors that are shown in the slide. Uh, for the political context, as anticipated, uh, recently implemented from 2019, the African continental free trade area is expected to increase trade within the African continent. Uh, so, in this work, we only consider the reduction of tariff barriers to interregional trade as the effect of this implementation, and uh, we expect it to have an impact on the agricultural and food system. Uh, especially for the African continent, uh, um, what we expect uh, uh, is that the reduction of tariffs will uh, lead to lower price for, con for a commodity, um, and this reduction in prices uh, will lead to more uh, uh, interregional trade and consequently more virtual water trade within the continent. Uh, our work consists mainly of four steps. The first one is the description of tool. Uh, because you, we use uh, uh, a database uh, named Quasi, uh, developed by Politecnico di Torino, and we want to implement uh, uh, the information uh, from Quasi in uh, Magnet, specifically the use of virtual water flows uh, in uh, Magnet. Uh, we have an historical background, so we want to investigate the historical trends of virtual water flows uh, of primary agricultural products using data uh, provided by Quasi, and uh, after we want to connect Quasi and Magnet uh, and uh, uh, see uh, the consequences of the policy analysis. Uh, so the first phase of this work provides an analysis of the historical trend in virtual water flows using the uh, virtual water matrices developed uh, within Quasi project. Uh, Quasi database um, uh, contains water footprint data for over 50 years and virtual water flows for 30 years. And the structure of the database is mainly based on uh, some inputs provided by FAO, such as the production tons, uh, bilateral trade metrics, uh, yield, uh, and uh, hectares cultivated. 
And the other key input is the water footprint data provided by Water Footprint Network, which published a large data set of unit water footprint for, for several primary agricultural goods. And this database named WaterStat includes uh, average values over the period 1996 to 2005 and has been the basis of the water footprint assessment. Therefore, from here, the quasi dataset assumes the time variability of the water footprint that is not detailed in WaterStat, uh, that is mainly explained by a ratio of agricultural yields. And so the resulting time varying water footprint are then applied to the FAO dataset on agricultural production, uh, country exports, and uh, reconstructed detailed uh, trade metrics, uh, thereby forming the quasi database. An important thing is that the virtual water content can be quantified in terms of uh, uh, green water component and blue water component according to whether the water is contributed by rainwater, and so we can speak about the green one, or by surface uh, and groundwater used for irrigation, and so we can uh, speak about blue one. And uh, as we are interested in investigating the virtual water flows resulting from an irrigation process, we will consider only blue water flows in this analysis, so from irrigation process. Okay, the tool that we want to use is MANIAT, that is a global general equilibrium model based uh, on the standard STAP model. And uh, in this work, uh, the intention is to adjust uh, the virtual water flows uh, uh, available in GTAP through the calculated water consumption data of irrigation crop in QASI. Um, so obviously we want to adjust this data for the baseline scenario that is uh, for the baseline year, that is 2014. And after we simulate uh, 2020 under the, under the SSP2 socioeconomic pathways, and uh, then we develop a baseline scenario for 2030 and uh, a policy scenario uh, for uh, 2030. Um, after describing the tools we use uh, in our work, we move on to explore the historical uh, background of the blue virtual water flows in Quasi. And uh, in this figure, for instance, we can see how Burkina Faso's main partners have changed from 1990 to 2010. For instance, uh, Asia becomes the main partner with a very important flow, while the European Union um, loses uh, its primacy and therefore reduces its import of blue virtual water from Burkina Faso. Uh, of course, the virtual water trade also depends on the tons of products exchanged. So in this picture on the left, we can see the historical trend of the export from Burkina Faso uh, to the other 16 region analyzed um, in, in terms of tons. And we can see how the trends continue to grow until 2016 in terms of quantity exported. But another important factor that can impact the volume of trade over time is the density of the network. And for this reason, it's important to also investigate uh, the network uh, density for Burkina Faso's import and export in terms of blue virtual water. So given the number of nodes, uh, trade network density is calculated as the ratio between uh, the number of existing links uh, and the number of all possible links uh, between nodes. And so these two graphs uh, on the right show the density of the network and uh, for the import uh, and for the export, uh, but in particular, they show that the density of the network uh, starts to increase after 1994. That was the year of Uruguay round when the growth uh, rate of the countries involved in the network starts to grow due to the spread of trade agreements in agricultural sector. Probably uh, the most important factor to investigate um, whether the growth in blue water exports is due not only to a general increase uh, in exported tons, but also to an increase in blue water intensive products trade. Uh, and in order to do it, uh, we analyze uh, the Burkina Faso export and we investigate the composition of each sectors in, in terms of uh, volume of virtual blue water or tons exported. Uh, so for this uh, purpose, this figure illustrates uh, the two sectors that differ more in terms of composition. Um, and we can see that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in the last two uh, years available on quasi-database, so 2015 and 2016, 
we see that in terms of tons exported, um, the, um, the most characteristic crop is coffee green, which is appear in the graph showing the composition in terms of virtual blue water. And this is due to the fact that the water used for the production of coffee green is all derived from precipitation, so green water, and so not accounted uh, in this analysis. Um, as far as the vegetable and fruit sector is concerned, we can observe an important quantity in terms of tons exported of green beans until about 24. And after this date, the most important export seems to belong to the category of uh, cash nuts. And also in terms of water quantity, we uh, can see that practically the entirety of exported virtual uh, blue water was composed of mangoes until more recent year when cash nuts nominated. So our aim is therefore uh, make uh, adjustment to water data in GTAP uh, in order to take into account uh, both the actual water requirement of the crop and the different sectoral composition of the products uh, in order to give more importance to those products uh, uh, within uh, the same sector that are more water demanding. And uh, in, the, in the construction of uh, water that we use in, uh, in Magnet, our aim is to compare the blue arrow, so the irrigation blue water, and uh, so the water footprint of primary products, uh, and the green arrows for virtual water imp so imports with the calculate data in the quasi database. But uh, uh, the question is why we want to compare and also to adjust uh, the data, the water data used in Magnet, uh, um, because there are some differences in the calculation methods of this water. In fact, the quasi database consider virtual water in terms of uh, crop water requirement defined as the water consumed during the growing season. Uh, Magnet, on the other hand, uh, consider irrigation water in terms of its withdrawal for a specific crop. So we can say that a portion of water withdrawal would return to the surface uh, and uh, be used again. And therefore, water withdrawal uh, used in Magnet may overestimate the net consumption of water. And this could be obviously a possible explanation for the difference in volumes uh, that we found uh, uh, in these two different approaches. And uh, to explain this difference, some authors uh, use the term requirement ratio. And this term is used to indicate uh, uh, the ratio between uh, crop water requirement uh, and water withdrawal. Uh, for irrigation, and uh, on a global scale, this ratio uh, can vary from 20 to 85%. So in our case, uh, uh, for virtual water flows concerning the export of uh, primary uh, agricultural products, this ratio is uh, uh, 73%, uh, so is the um, ratio between the crop water requirement returned by quasi and the irrigation water withdrawal provided uh, by Mania. Uh, in order uh, to adjust the manual virtual water flows and to take into account uh, uh, the, the composition and the actual uh, uh, crop water uh, uh, requirement, um, we uh, adjust the water data in manual for both production and export side, uh, obviously for the base year 2014. So the first step involves the production side and since manual uh, considers the economic value of production in say dollar, we decided to calculate the uh, weighted unit water footprint uh, by taking the economic value of the products uh, considered as the weight of the production. So we multiply the dollars of each region, uh, S, and each sector, I, um, uh, by the uh, weighted unit water footprint obtained uh, from quasi data. And so uh, for each region and uh, uh, each sector, we calculated the cubic meters per dollar as the sum of water footprint uh, of the products included in each sectors divided uh, per uh, uh, all the economic values produced for the same products. After that, for the export, uh, um, we calibrate the virtual water flows of primary products uh, present in, uh, available in Magnet uh, through uh, this equation. So um, we uh, multiply a parameter that uh, we obtain from the quasi database by the amounts of uh, uh, primary production water previously calibrated. And uh, we multiply again by the share of uh, export dollar in relation to the production. 
And uh, the parameter that we use uh, for calibration is the ratio of cubic meters per dollar provided by Quasi compared to the same ratio derived from Magnet. And uh, note that uh, um, the numerator is the weighted average of the total water export, exported over the total dollars exported for each link. Uh, so uh, this allows us to give a different weight to the crops uh, within the sector, to giving importance to the composition. And this is just an example uh, in order to show the importance of this composition, because these images show the subdivision of the sector vegetables through its uh, nut sector for the various crop included. And uh, so different colors are different crops. And uh, from the calculation obtained for the weighted average, we find that, uh, uh, for instance, the water footprint of Burkina Faso production uh, for this sector is uh, 87 uh, uh, cubic meters per ton, while if we consider the weighted unit water footprint uh, of uh, all Bur uh, Burkina Faso exports to Asia, for instance, is uh, 546 uh, cubic meters. So why this difference? Uh, this difference uh, uh, is due to the composition because the unit water footprint of export is higher than the unit water footprint of production uh, because the unit foot water footprint of production includes uh, a, wide, a wide variety of products uh, that is uh, highlighted by the different color, uh, while the export, uh, in this case to Asia, is almost exclusively uh, cash nuts, uh, so high water demand crops. So, uh, now we, we speak about the implementation of the policy scenario. And so uh, we, we take a look at uh, the situation in Africa, in, in, in the continent. Uh, these histograms show the results of implementing the uh, AF CFTA scenario in 2030 on the whole African continent. And first, we can see uh, that there is a shift from the primary sector to the industrial sector on average. Uh, Secondly, we can see that uh, um, we can see how the implementation of the free trade area will lead to an increase in intracontinental trade and a reduction in the extracontinental trade. And, and in particular, uh, for the primary sector, we will have a reduction in uh, exports uh, um, in the exports uh, um, outside the continent and uh, a slight increase in imports. For Burkina Faso, we can draw a similar conclusion regarding the shift from the primary to industrial sector and uh, the average increase in intracontinental uh, trade compared to extracontinental trade. But the interesting thing is to see that uh, for the primary sector, there would be a general reduction in trade outside uh, the, the continent, uh, while within the continent, Burkina Faso will increase imports and decrease exports. Uh, these analyses usually are in uh, quantities, so in USA dollar. So what about uh, virtual water? Uh, on the left, we can see Africa. So for the African continent, we can see that uh, at the extra trade level, the calibration allows us to reduce the overestimation of the water simulated by Magnet. While for the intra-trade, where import and export value are equal, we can see that uh, the volume traded under the scenario increases slightly. For Burkina Faso, on the right, it is interesting to see how the calibration um, allow again to reduce the overestimation for imported crops, um, while slightly increasing the estimate for exported crops uh, at the extra trade level. And the, uh, uh, the African continental free trade area scenario seems to reduce a bit the exported flows uh, and to increase a little the imported flow comparing to the baseline calibration. Uh, if we look at the intra-level under the policy scenario, imports will increase um, and exports will decrease uh, slightly compared to the calibrated baseline. So the um, preliminary results, because uh, uh, this is a work in progress, uh, uh, is that historical trends from quasi show an increase in blue virtual water trade over time. And uh, for Africa and Burkina Faso, we um, can say that uh, um, the implementation of the policy scenario in terms of USA dollar suggests a shift from agricultural to industrial trade. Uh, 
uh, and uh, we can uh, we can observe that for agricultural products an increase uh, there is an increase in intracontinental trade in USA dollar and uh, the same could be uh, said also for virtual water flows. So the calibration using the parameter obtaining from quasi allow us to have value more similar to those calculated by giving more importance to crops uh, with higher water demand. And uh, so we can see in summary that in terms of quantity, uh, the, the implementation of the policy will lead to an increase in intra-trade and the same thing can be deduced in terms of virtual water. You got two minutes. I finished. <laughs> <laughs> Good time. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation, Benedetta. Um, looks like there's already uh, some, some some questions coming in, or, or have they already come in, but they were, uh, were the, I think, asked during the middle of your presentation. So um, uh, I'll, I'll ask the, uh, the the question askers maybe to uh, to they can uh, restate their question, or I'll just I'll just read it now and they can say it again if they uh, want to adjust their question having seen your whole presentation. Um, so uh, first from was from uh, uh, Ivan, um, and, uh, he asks, how do you adjust the, the base year of the model to match different sources? Uh, okay, uh, the, the differences between the GTAP water and uh, quasi, um, quasi database uh, obviously are due also for uh, the, the composition. So we find uh, mapping uh, from the sectors, uh, the, from the sector of, uh, of GTAP, and we select uh, the crops that are included in each sector. So quasi database provided uh, um, data for each uh, crops, each uh, uh, separated crops. And so we aggregate under uh, the, the sector considered in, uh, in GTAP. And uh, we adjust uh, the by year uh, uh, for 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 the water demand uh, in the in the way that I um, illustrated. So using uh, this parameter that consider the ratio between uh, the cubic meters uh, for for each dollar considered by quasi uh, on the cubic meters uh, uh, for each dollar considered by Magnet. And so using this parameter. Uh, we um, give more relevance uh, to the data, calculated data by quasi, and uh, so uh, it, it, we obtain uh, a ratio between uh, the, the two values of water uh, equal to 95%, so pretty, pretty good. Uh, Iman, did, um, did you want to um, clarify anything, or, or are, you, are you satisfied with that response? Yeah, so I wanted to ask that does quasi shows a lot of year on year variation on uh, the estimates on water? Because GTAP, so when we talk about GTAP, we talk about long run or medium run. Okay, it's uh, kind of like the average of a couple of years. It's, it's not uh, exactly uh, one specific year. Uh, yeah. When we talk about water, specifically in production. Uh, if, if you want to connect that, uh, and then we want to simulate something to, to other um, to other shots. Uh, so I, I wanted to make sure that we consider changes in temperature, weather, water requirements, and other things that uh, comes from the difference uh, between blue water, green water in different years. Sorry, I can't hear well, but um, you say that uh, you are um, you are curious about the the time varying of uh, of the water. Uh, so the, uh, specifically, how uh, how much year on year variation you see on quasi database? Uh, in, in, over time, you mean? Okay. Uh, no, we we. Um, uh, we have the, this, uh, this time varying uh, factor that we consider <clears throat> that is different uh, from the water stat data that is an average uh, uh, 10 years uh, because we consider the ratio for the yield. So uh, for each crop, we consider that this uh, 
variability over time uh, derived by the uh, ratio uh, for the for the yield uh, part of the calculation of evapotranspiration and for the blue and green differences uh, we um, we take uh, the, the 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 ratio uh, that uh, o extra uh, that is water status source uh, give us uh, for the uh, for the year 2000 and so the thing that we assume here is that uh, the irrigation lands uh, doesn't change over time. And this is a really, really strict um, assumption that we want uh, to use in the next processes, in the next steps of this uh, research. And also we want to include the historical trend in the calibration, because in this moment we just calibrate uh, 2014. And so we assume that the basket of the sector, uh, so the, the crops that uh, compose each sector, uh, remain the, the same uh, in 2020 uh, from 2014. And this is obviously possible, not true. So uh, it's important to see the historical trends from quasi in order to take into account uh, um, the, the most uh, probable crops that is uh, most exported or imported. Um, and so to give more importance uh, to these crops. And uh, yeah, and the next step is also um, underline the implication on the water resource of Burkina Faso, because on the African continent in general, because if uh, there is a reduction in the extra uh, trade, uh, we expect uh, to find that maybe they use uh, less the domestic water resource because <laughs> Um, they have uh, um, less uh, less uh, crops to to exchange, but uh, the things that is interesting uh, uh, in this calibration uh, is that we consider the composition, and so maybe in USA dollar there is uh, less external trade, but the only external trade is composed by water demanding crops, and so there is no uh, say it is not not domestic water saving in this process. So these are the next step. Yeah, thank you for the explanation that clarifies Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you both. Um, there's another uh, question from uh, Yang Xuan Liu. Um, it says, uh, hi, Benedetta, nice presentation. Can you explain a little more about uh, your data updating process from 2014 to 2020? Uh, which value do you use, current value or constant values? Um, Yangchuan, I don't know if you want to uh, say anything more about this this question, or which because it was asked in the middle of the presentation, so you, I'll probably refer to a specific slide. Yeah, uh, for the tw tw uh, 2014, I use um, a current value because I uh, have to compare just uh, just one year, and for 2020, <laughs> maybe Jason, you can answer because it's the simulation uh, processed in Maniat, right? Um, I, is, is, is it was this question referring to the uh, to the that uh, magnet description slide? Okay, yeah. Um, this question refers to when when you updating the database from 2014 to 2020. Uh, I noticed you updated production GDP, etc. I wonder whether you you use a constant value, for example, holding all the. Uh, updating data to 2014 or use the current value when you do the updating. I just want to know a little bit more about the updating process. No, uh, it's constant values because GTAP consider constant values in this uh, in this phase. So, um, yeah, if I if I could. Uh, uh, jump in here then um, the the SSP scenarios uh, have a uh, uh, have, a, have, a, have a, a GDP and a population pathway so uh, uh, magnet then exogenously follows uh, updates with GDP volume the uh, the SSP scenario pathways allowing um, uh, production technologies uh, to to adjust and obviously to meet those pathways and then for the policies, we switched it around. So then those production uh, technologies are then exogenous. Um, and the, the GDP will meet those targets endogenously. 
but this uh, we can also discuss this uh, after the presentation uh, after uh, after the session. Um, know more about the model. Um, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank uh, Benedetta for her, her presentation. And um, next up, uh, check the schedule. Um, we have uh, Lee Humphreys. Uh, he's an economist at the Department of, uh, of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs at the United Kingdom. And he will be presenting, um, uh, his presentation will be assessing the impact of dual production systems on agri-food trade and trade policy. Thank you, Lee. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks, Jason. Um, just to share my screen. Great. So, uh, hello, everyone. Um, and thanks, Jason, for the introduction. Uh, so, yeah, I work at the UK's Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And today I'll be talking about uh, dual production systems and how we might use kind of a, a CG model or the GTAP model to assess uh, the impact of these systems on agri-food trade and trade policy. Uh, so first of all, uh, just a little bit, uh, kind of a slide on what dual, uh, dual production systems are here. So agri-food exporters um, are often required to meet different standards depending on their target market. So there may be different standards between the domestic market that they are producing in and certain uh, export markets that they kind of are targeting. And that might be kind of different processes, um, different requirements, um, et cetera. And so sometimes they will employ um, what I call here dual production systems. So basically they can be understood as one industry producing two separate commodities. So similar commodities in terms of uh, kind of what they are, but then separate that there's different processes, different requirements. Um, so an example I've put here is that Australian farmers have set up a dedicated cattle herd segregation and processing system. And this is for producing hormone free beef for European markets. So within the EU, the use of hormones um, are banned in beef production. And so kind of for these Australian farmers to be able to export to the EU or to the, uh, the European markets, they've they set up this dual production system where they produce both hormone free and hormone um, fed beef. So understanding the impact of these production systems is, is, is important as it could have implications for the ease at which exporters shift production to meet certain standards. And this might have implications for the impact of trade policy uh, in terms of uh, the ability they have to, to shift production to meet standards of the different markets and if, if they're new markets and they've just gained access to them. So how might we go about approaching this? Um, so this table just highlights a few of the approaches. So the one industry, one commodity approach, that's just the standard uh, kind of classic GTAP model where you've got one activity producing one commodity. Uh, the box in the top right hand corner is two industries producing the same commodity. So this assumes that the two industries are separate, but the commodity they produce is identical, which is not quite what we want here. But as an example, this, this might be the case for electricity when you've got several industries such as renewables or fossil fuels producing both producing electricity is kind of the same quantity so the two approaches that we're interested in are the the two industry two commodity approach and the one industry and two commodity approach so the two industry two commodity approach is where there are two completely separate industries um, and they're uh, producing different commodities. So they're, they're almost so different that they're separate industries. Um, and then the one industry, two commodity approach is where we've got two outputs that are different, but they're being produced by the same industry. So they compete for the same inputs. 
So first of all, I will go through the two industry, two commodity approach. Um, so this is the simpler of the two approaches. I'll go through and the kind of the easier to implement, which is why um, I started here. So what this approach does is it takes uh, the, the GTAP sector and splits it into its, its various different sectors. And this is using uh, Splitcom, um, the, the program developed by Horage. Uh, and this can be used to, to separate these sectors. So the example I've given here is cattle meat, um, and it's split into three separate sectors. So we've got the lamb sector and then two beef sectors, hormone treated beef and hormone free beef. And this is where we see that kind of um, the different the difference. So in terms of uh, the steps of this approach, first of all, it's the kind of the data collection to carry out the split and then using that data to split the, the GTAP sector within Splitcom. So in terms of data collection, there's two main parts. First of all, we need to split the, the GTAP sector into its disaggregated sectors and commodities. So for example, here, splitting red meat or cattle meat into beef and lamb. So this is kind of the initial split. And then the second part is, is taking the beef or lamb and splitting it into uh, the kind of, or however uh, you want to kind of split. So here I've split beef into growth hormone treated and non-growth hormone treated. So there's two parts to the data collection, but we do, we combine this so that the, the split is carried out in, in one go within Splitcom. So in terms of the first part, splitting uh, into beef and lamb, there's three main inputs into, into Splitcom. So first of all, we split the GTAP trade flows. And then we also have to split the GTAP input flows. So that's the kind of inputs into the into the industry and then also the uses of the GTAP commodity. So where that commodity is being used um, in terms of uh, in intermediate sectors or kind of private consumption, how that use is being split between these new commodities that we're looking at. So where does the data come from? Um, so to split the GTAP trade flows, we use bilateral trade data that comes from the BACI database, which uh, comes from CEPI. This uses UM contract trade data, and it, it gives us bilateral trade flows for more than 5,000 products at the HS6 level and uh, 200 countries. So then we use this data, aggregate it up to, to our aggregation, and we we've got uh, data to split the trade flows. In terms of how we split the GTAP input flows, so we here we use production data, and this comes from FAO stat uh, as we're looking at agricultural products. So this is making a, a fairly uh, kind of large assumption that uh, the way we split input flows, we're assuming that each dollar each dollar worth of the output of the new commodities uses the same inputs. So with the beef and lamb example, we're assuming that a dollar worth of lamb uh, uses the same inputs as a dollar worth of beef. And then finally, uh, to split the uses of the GTAP commodity, we use consumption data. Uh, so this is a, a bit more fiddly as consumption data is really hard to get get hold of at this kind of level um so what we do is we use the data from the gtap database and uh, uh, apportion the production imports and exports using the shares from the data we've already collected uh, so we then and, and then we calculate consumption to equal production minus exports plus imports so we kind of uh, work out consumption like that so then we've got uh, this kind of fairly comprehensive data, but this only splits to beef and lamb. 
Uh, the next step is to take the, the data we've got here and split it into hormone and non-hormone treated sectors. And, and how is this done? Uh, I'll go through beef as an example. So first of all, how do we split the, the inputs between the new sectors, so between the hormone and non-hormone treated? Uh, what we do is we use the percentage of production that is hormone treated in that country or in that region and use that as as a kind of proxy for uh, where where the input should be going. And you can see the, the data that I've used here. Um, and you can see there that because hormones are banned in the EU, the UK and the EU27, uh, there's no production of hormone beef. So one one extra kind of point to say here is that when, I guess one of the reasons why we do this is because to produce the commodity that uh, is his hormone, there's this extra cost. And so it's estimated that the cost increase from not using growth hormones is between seven and 8%. So this is, quite a significant cost increase for not using growth hormones. Uh, so we want to try and kind of figure out what, what impact that might have on kind of production and, and trade flows and um, uh, that sort of uh, kind of what impact this will have. We also need to split bilateral trade. Um, so I've got data here for the percentage of trade flows that are hormone treated. Again, this is really hard data to come by, um, but what what I've done is set total in, total exports of hormone beef equal to the hormone beef production shares, and then to exports to the UK and EU equal to zero because um, the, the imports are or the hormones are banned, and then split exports among the remaining four countries according to their consumption shares. And so this is an example here. Again, so this is this is all a very much a work in progress. So these these numbers are uh, kind of at the moment kind of best estimates. And if anybody knows of anything better, it would be really appreciated. Um, but this is what we use for now. And then finally, uh, kind of how are the old uses split between the new sectors? So again, uh, the percentage of consumption that is hormone treated. Uh, I've used a, a proxy here using the production um, percentage that is hormone treated uh, just to give us an idea of, of what consumption uh, might be like. So that uh, explains a bit around the, the data that's required to enter to kind of use within Splitcom and Splitcom can be supplied supplied with comprehensive data. And so all of the what we've collected before is then input into Splitcom to carry out the split. And then Splitcom produces uh, a consistent split database with the, the sector split out. Like I said, uh, I kind of mentioned that uh, there's a few assumptions that we're making here, particularly around uh, splitting inputs using production data and how we assume that each dollar worth of output of each new commodity uses the same inputs and I think that's quite important. Um, a second one that I've not mentioned is that each new commodity is only used as an immediate in intermediate input by itself. Um, so for example all beef used, so all beef is used by beef and none of it is used by lamb. Um, just to try and kind of keep this uh, as simple as possible. So once we've used uh, Splitcom, we now have these new sectors, including hormone and non-hormone sectors, um, and they're entirely separate sectors. And then we can kind of use this new database to to run scenarios and look at the impact that they might have. 
So I've got an illustrative scenario here, just to give an idea of, of what this might, might be used for. Uh, so first of all, we uh, I, I simulate a negative productivity shock for the high cost of production of hormone beef hormone free beef. So this is done to, to simulate that increased cost of producing hormone free beef. And so it's only done where hormone beef is produced. This is because the fact uh, I'm assuming that uh, in places where hormone hormone beef isn't produced that kind of increased cost is already baked into the data, so there's no need to, to shock the productivity of the hormone free beef. And then in terms of a scenario, um, like I said, illustrative multilateral reduction in beef tariffs. So what happens if we reduce the tariff on beef by 25% in all regions? And this is for both hormone and hormone free. And then we can kind of have a look at what happens to, to trade. So this, uh, uh, some very illustrative results um, done this week to give an idea of what this might be used for. Um, so I'm still trying to uh, understand these a bit more myself, but I think there's a couple of interesting points to, to pick up. Uh, so just, uh, so the top two tables, uh, the top one is hormone beef, the, the percentage change in real exports of hormone beef. The second table is the percentage change in real exports of hormone free beef. And then this bottom table is the change in real exports of beef. So that's without the hormone or hormone free split. So I think one interesting thing to point out is if we look at uh, kind of UK and EU imports, uh, so that's the, the fourth, fifth column. We can see that first of all, in the beef scenario, the the, the no uh, the no split scenario, there's kind of large increases in imports from Australia, New Zealand, and the US. Um, and this is kind of as expected because the the tariff on beef is high in the baseline um, for the UK and the EU because it's fairly protected. So when we reduce that tariff, there's an increase in exports. When we then split out hormone free and hormone beef, uh, we can see that there's very little change uh, in in hormone beef imports, um, as we would expect because of the kind of ban. Um, but you can also, I think, what's interesting is the the change for the the hormone free beef exports and you can see that here New Zealand is actually the one that does best because um, it increases its share uh, against this this uh, the scenario for just beef whereas Australia and the US kind of lose out because um, they can't supply as much hormone free beef because they're not as focused on hormone free beef as New Zealand is so that's one thing um, that I thought was quite interesting. Another was looking at US Australia trade, um, given that they're both big uh, uh, beef exporters. So we can see that in the, and I think it's, uh, particularly looking at uh, US exports to Australia, you can see that in the beef scenario with no split, exports to Australia increased by around 2%. But this is kind of hiding this, the different effects between hormone beef and hormone free beef. So the hormone free beef, we see a 13% decrease in exports to Australia, whereas in the hormone beef, we see a 2.5% a increase. Um, so just uh, kind of some interesting initial results. So that's the, the first approach that I mentioned. There is a second approach, which uh, is slightly more um, complex, but uh, extends the, the previous approach. 
um, and we do this by using the latest GTAP model version 7. So what the, the newest uh, GTAP model allows us to do is it allows for multi-production and this is through the use of a non-diagonal make matrix. So the, the classic GTAP model, uh, it's one activity produces one commodity and you can't kind of uh, diverge, you can't change that at all. Whereas the, the newer model version seven uh, allows for this multi-production. So you can have one, one activity producing several commodities. Uh, so this kind of one industry, two commodity approach. And there's this, uh, uh, and when we do have this happening, we have this elasticity of transformation, which um, works between the two outputs. So where activities producing multiple outputs, the changes in supply of a certain output depends not only on the overall level of output in the sector, but also the shift, uh, any shift in the mix of commodities supplied by that sector. And this is where this approach differs. In terms of uh, the steps to the approach, again, um, it's kind of very similar to before in the, the first two steps. So the data collection is almost identical. Uh, the, the data collection is it's exactly the same as before and so is the the initial stage of using splitcom so we collect the same data we use splitcom in the same way and we have this split data set which has hormone and non-hormone sectors the difference here is we take that a step further convert the data to gtap model version 7 data and then we can aggregate the industries together so we have this one single industry producing both hormone and hormone-free beef. And this is uh, the, the more complicated ex uh, kind of extension to the approach and uh, is still a very much a work in progress. So this, this approach is still quite not finished. Um, I'm still working on it um, and the aim is to to be able to use this, this second approach and compare to run the same kind of scenarios that we run in the first approach and compare the two to see if there's any differences and, and what differences that might make. Uh, so that's um, pretty much it, but there's a few next steps that I'd like to take. The, the first step is around how we include the, the hormone-free cost increase. So instead of using the simulation to, to include this cost increase for hormone-free beef, uh, there might be a way to include it within the commodity split. So that initial, the first stage, and then using a, a kind of using a scalar to reflect the extra costs. Uh, I guess, one thing that I did think of was there might be this a small shares issue when we look at hormone hormone produced beef um, if it's kind of banned, and then kind of finally just to to look at a few different scenarios and compare to previous results and how we might be able to figure out uh, a bit more about the differences between the the two um, modities. So that's everything, but. Any questions or feedback would be appreciated. Okay, thank you very much, Lee, for that uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I already uh, see a question uh, from uh, Iman. Um, has, uh, I think this is also asked in the middle of your presentation. Um, uh, very interesting. Uh, where does the seven to eight percent cost increase? Uh, uh, applied to does it is it applied to uh, all inputs or um, uh, or is it or is it on the specific inputs so maybe not land but on feed or labor uh, so uh, at the moment it's actually applied um, to, to all inputs so it's a productivity shop um, through AOSX uh, through that kind of 
the productivity within the industry. So it's at the moment it's all input. Um, May I elaborate that? Yeah, go, go ahead, please. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, when we have these uh, changes in cost, so that means even when we split the database, the, the cost of uh, or the price of uh, hormone beef should be a little bit lower than the previous cost and the, the cost of the hormone should be higher. Uh, so in, in I, uh, the question was not about modeling, but uh, real world applications. So uh, this seven to eight uh, percent is it because they they need better feed or the high quality feed? I don't know. Is it grass fed or is it different? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so in terms of like the real world, like it comes from the fact that uh, the when you use growth hormones, um, you there's better output for the kind of inputs. So to produce the same output, you'd need less kind of uh, cattle to produce the same amount of beef, for example. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I guess it's that kind of, you, you would maybe need less land, you'd need less uh, feed. Uh, it's just that everything that you do use is uh, the kind of output, or the, the efficiency is improved by using growth hormones. So that's where that kind of cost uh, uh, benefit or the, the kind of let the, the decreased cost or the increased cost for hormone free beef is that you need more, you need more cows, you need more land, you need uh, more of everything to, to produce the same amount of output as you would the hormone beef. If that Thank makes you. sense. Yeah, thanks for that. We have uh, another question as well from uh, from Chong Jing. Um, she says, uh, "Great, great work, Lee. In addition to splitting the base data, uh, been any adjustment to the model parameters?" That's a, a really good question and one that I uh, would like to explore. So at the moment, there's there's no adjustment to the model parameters. Um, they're just uh, kind of taken from. So they would they would be the same as the kind of cattle meat sector uh, in the GTAP database, um, but it's definitely something that I uh, I would like to look into to see because um, I'm sure that there might be some changes. Um, but yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I see uh, an, another question uh, also from, from, from Jing. Uh, um, she writes, an important assumption in your first approach is per dollar output uses the same amount of inputs. Uh, why is that assumption made? Uh, that, so, a <laughs> good question. Um, that assumption is made to make kind of life a bit easier. So it means that we can use real world production data to split the inputs so otherwise we would have to use different data or kind of uh, other input data to, to split the inputs whereas by making this assumption we can then use production data from from kind of fao stat and things like that to split the gtap inputs um because we're, we're basically saying that uh so the, the kind of the previous the initial GTAP sector has this amount of inputs um, to produce this amount of outputs. We're now saying that, so say 75% of production is, is beef, then we're just saying that 75% of those inputs go to beef rather than lamb. Um, and if we didn't make that assumption, we, we can uh, kind of do that. So, that can, so can I say that that's uh, uh, because the limitation of data, like you don't have the specific cost of structure for different uh, commodity production. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Is there 
Any more questions for Lee? Uh, then uh, let's uh, thank our speaker. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, and move on to the next presenter. It's uh, uh, Shoata uh, Adhikari. And she will be uh, presenting. Um, oh, she's, sorry, she's from the, the, uh, the University of Georgia, and she will be presenting the impacts of the Sino-US trade war on major cotton exporting and importing economies. So I'll let her get started. And uh, the floor is yours. Can you see my screen? Yes. Oops, now I can see it, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone, again. Uh, so I'm Shweta Adhikari. I'm from the University of Georgia, and I'm presenting the work which is in uh, collaboration with the University of Georgia and Bodhi University because we have uh, Dr. Jing here, and we also have Anju and Liu. Uh, so we, uh, this is a research that is uh, currently, in, um, so we are still studying a lot of components of it. So any feedbacks and comments are highly welcome. Uh, so the topic is the impact of Sino-US trade war on the major exporting, uh, major cotton and textile trading economies. I'm sorry, my slide is not working. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. So exports, uh, it is a export is an important uh, important component on the U.S. cotton industry, and cotton is the second highest U.S. agricultural export to China by total value after soybean. Uh, on the other hand, uh, textile industry in China it is the largest in terms of both uh, production as well as export. And apart from these two major uh, players, we have Vietnam, Brazil. India, Australia, Bangladesh, which are other major players when it comes to cotton and textile trade. So this is a chart that uh, represents uh, some of the major exporting and importing uh, economies when it comes to cotton. And I have uh, 2017 data because uh, the trade war, it started in 2018. So this, this was the um, th these were the major exporting countries in 2017. We have United States as the world's largest uh, exporter. And then uh, we have um, Bangladesh, Vietnam. These are some of the cotton, major cotton importing countries uh, apart from China. So this is the uh, timeline of the U.S.-China trade war. So trade war, it started in 2018, and it included tariffs on several products and commodities, including textile and cotton. Uh, on July 6th of 2018, China imposed uh, an additional tariff on um, about uh, 991 million U.S. dollars of um, products, and which also included cotton. Uh, and then this was followed uh, by um, U.S. You know, imposing tariff of additional 10% on $3.7 billion of Chinese textile and apparel products. So this paper tag uh, war was followed by the phase one trade deal, which uh, was in February of 2000. Um, Ninth, uh, sorry, February of 2020, and uh, this um, temporarily lifted uh, the this temporarily lifted lifted the tariff that was implemented by uh, China on cotton. But uh, for the US, the tariff was reduced to 7.5 from 15 percent after the phase one. So this. But this topic is important since uh, most of the researches when it comes to trade war, they have focused on soybean. And uh, there are some of the researches that I have uh, tried to point out in this uh, presentation that have focused on uh, cotton in some manner. So there is one that says that cotton accounts for 40% of apparel imported by the United States and of which 30% is made of cotton only. 
uh, and there has been some researches done in the sector of trade war. Uh, it says that uh, this trade war has led to rerouting of exports of cotton and other cotton importing countries. Uh, and um, yeah, these are, these are uh, some of the researches that have been done before, but uh, since there are very limited researches that have focused on this particular sector and we still have those tariffs being implemented, uh, we wanted to look at the uh, textile as well as cotton uh, side of the trade war and look at the impact on, on various exporting and importing economies. So the major objective of the study is to investigate the impact of the tariff on global cotton as well as textile industries. So we have uh, looked at five cases. So the first three cases, these were uh, before the trade uh, deal that happened in 2020. So the first three cases, this one, the first one is uh, the 25% uh, the tariff which was imposed by China on the US cotton. And the second one is uh, the 50% tariff which was imposed by the US on Chinese textile. Then we have mine effect, both the tariffs when they were implemented. Uh, then after it was reduced to 7.5% by the US, we have that. And since uh, the temporary lift is based on the quota system only, only certain uh, number of, only certain importers get that um, reduction uh, of 25% tariff, we have looked at uh, case five, which is the 7.5% tariff imposed by US on Chinese textile and 25% tariff imposed by China on US. So we identify the change in GDP, uh, endowment of countries, um, then trade volume prices, and all of those uh, uh, different factors to see what are, what are some of the impacts. So uh, materials and methods. So the data we used. Uh, this this is actually a follow up of one of uh, of a research that we were doing before. We had GTAP cotton version one uh, that uh, had regional integration of China, US, and the rest of the world only. And now uh, for this research, we have uh, developed a. Uh, um, GTAP cotton version two, uh, which has. Uh, so these are six regions and then uh, six sectors aggregated. So we have China, US, Vietnam, Brazil, uh, South, uh, other Southeast Asian and then South Asian countries and the rest of the world. And in case of sectors, we have six, dif six different sectors that is listed below. Uh, I would like to go through some of the results, some of the preliminary results that we already have. Uh, uh, we have simulated, again, we have simulated five different cases, and this, um, I, I hope this animation works. Uh, so I have uh, tried to present the result one by one. Uh, hopefully, it would make sense. Uh, so when only China uh, implemented, the, implemented the tariff, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make this animation work. Okay, when when only China implemented the uh, tariff on the US cotton, the export from the uh, US to China decreases by about 65%. And, um, but this has shown some of the positive impact on other uh, other major players. So um, there has been an increase in export from the US to Vietnam, uh, increase in export to Brazil, and then increase in export to other Southeast Asian and then South Asian countries. Uh, so overall, um, the total US cotton export, since uh, China is one of the major players, uh, the total cotton export decreased by 13.64%. And this has impact on the land um, use as well as uh, the employment, uh, the labor use. So these are the prices of the labor that has decreased due to the decrease in export of cotton uh, from the US to uh, all the countries. Um, and the 
the decrease in cotton import from the US has been fulfilled by uh, China importing from other countries. So we can see from this arrows uh, that uh, Brazil and then other Southeast Asian and then uh, South Asian countries and Vietnam, there has been increase in cotton import. So these are the total uh, increase in uh, cotton export uh, from this country. So we have Brazil that uh, has increased in 3.13%. We have other Southeast Asian and South Asian countries increase in four, uh, increase by 4.8%, and then total Vietnam and cotton export increased by 12.96%. Um, and then uh, we can see that the land and labor prices have increased in these countries, uh, which suggests that uh, more cotton has is being produced in these countries following followed by the trade war between China and the US. This second case, this one is the 15% tariff by US on Chinese textile. So after US uh, implemented the uh, tariff on the Chinese textile, uh, the export to the U.S. decreased by 55.21%. So the uh, U.S. imports a large uh, proportion of its textile from India, from China, and then uh, this increase in tariff has reduced the import from China. Uh, then uh, the total export from China decreased by 0.075%, which is pretty less compared uh, to the amount um, that was uh, decreased to the US since China has been diversifying a lot when it comes to partners and then it has increased its export uh, to other countries. And for the US, it has also diversified its uh, origin and then we have uh, Vietnam, uh, Brazil, and then other uh, Southeast Asian and South Asian countries which has increased the export of textile to the United States followed by it, uh, following the trade war. Uh, so these are the increase in textile export from this country. So we have the highest uh, increase is uh, for the Vietnam. So Vietnam has benefited the most when it comes to trade war. And um, uh, uh, we have land the prices increased and then wages have increased for this country. Uh, so this one is case three, and I have tried to show the uh, dual effect of the um, uh, tariff for the U.S. So since there is a 15% tariff imposed by the U.S. on Chinese textile and 25% imposed by China on the U.S. cotton, and cotton is a uh, is an important raw material when it comes to textile, uh, there has been observed a dual effect of U.S. cotton export to um, dual effect on the U.S. cotton export to China. Uh, however, uh, having said that, dual tariff had lower total reduction in export than expected since U.S. Uh, is looking for, U.S. has looked for a lot of market diversification. And we can, uh, if, if you observe the market these days, we can see a lot of uh, uh, textiles, we, we can see a lot of clothes that, uh, that are made in Bangladesh, Vietnam, and those countries. Uh, I have uh, the table for the percentage change in cotton prices in the US. So um, after the first 25% um, tariff increase on US cotton, we can see that uh, the cotton prices has uh, reduced by 1.146%. Uh, and uh, when it comes to case two, that is U.S. tariff on uh, Chinese textile, the cotton prices has actually increased. Um, so um, uh, other three cases were the highest, again, the highest percentage gains we can see in the 25% Chinese tariff on U.S. cotton. And after the first uh, phase one trade deal was signed, uh, we can see that the percentage uh, change in cotton prices is uh, followed by the highest one. So we have a decrease in cotton prices in this case. So uh, this slide shows how did uh, Vietnam, uh, other Southeast Asian and Asian countries and rest of the world benefit from the trade war. And this is case three because uh, when both of the um, countries were implemented that uh, implementing the tariff, then what was the effect? of this one. And I have uh, added this news article, which is a recent news article that says that the effect is still um, 
observed in the market, um, especially in case of clothing and textile. Uh, so before the pre uh, phase one trade deal, when both sides were implementing the tariff, uh, we can see that there has been an export increase um, of cotton as well as textile in case of Vietnam, Brazil, and other countries. And we can see that the GDP has also increased significantly. Uh, so both uh, textile and cotton export has increased from this reason. And also another factor is the trade balance. So um, trade balance with export minus import. Uh, so while for cotton um, negative trade balance of Vietnam, we, we can see that there is a negative trade balance of Vietnam, which also suggests that these countries are importing a lot of cotton to make textiles that can be exported to uh, US and other countries during this trade war. And this one is after the phase one trade deal. So this was signed in again uh, after the phase one trade deal, uh, US agreed to cut the tariff imposed um, uh, from 15% uh, to 7.5%. And um, this is the impact on the Chinese textile industry after the tariff was reduced. We see that the export has uh, export before it was it was reduced by 55%, but after uh, there was a decrease in tariff, the reduction is less compared to the previous one. Uh, and then the total export has also, the total export reduction is also less when we have only 7.5% tariff in action. Um, the highest export, um, it was Vietnam, and there was a 15% tariff, and it was a is again Vietnam after the phase one trade deal, uh, but export increases comparatively lower compared to the first, uh, the second case. Um, and we have the price change and waste, waste change. So uh, price change, this is this is for the land price change. And uh, we can see that the land price uh, reduction is comparatively lower. Uh, and similarly, the labor uh, waste reduction is comparatively lower in case of the uh, in case uh, after the phase one trade deal was signed. So this one shows uh, after the phase one trade deal, did uh, these countries continue to um, get uh, benefited um, from the US-China trade war? So we can still see that there is an increase in export of cotton, textile, um, again, uh, this, Increase is comparatively lower than previous um, when there was uh, when both countries were implementing the tariff. Uh, in this case, the reduction is comparatively the increase is comparatively lower, uh, but still there is an increase in GDP by a pretty large amount, especially for the Vietnam. And uh, this one is a data by the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, so apparel import from China to the U.S. declined by more than 6.4 billion dollars since 2000. 2017, and um, this is mainly because we can see that Vietnam it has increased in export of textile, and we can see a lot of, uh, increase um, in import by the U.S. from Vietnam. Again, this this is a study uh, that is that we are currently doing, and it's not complete yet. And we are still looking for uh, ways to adjust the data that uh, matches the uh, 2017 based data, so that we have um, we can see the real effect of trade war. But these are some of the simulations, and uh, I would like to present some of the summaries from them. So uh, we can see that 25% uh, Chinese tariff on U.S. cotton decreased cotton export from the U.S. to China, and um, this um, uh, this resulted in U.S. Uh, diversification of market for its cotton, and it favored Brazil, Vietnam, and other countries. And textile is another important side of global cotton supply chain. So dual effect have been observed when it comes to uh, the U.S. since. Um, they are using a lot of cotton imported from, uh, they are using a lot of cotton in the textile. Uh, 
and then 15 percent u.s tariff on chinese textile reduce textile export from china to the u.s substantially and decrease uh, total chinese textile export as well and when both countries implement the tariff the effect is severe on both sides uh, with prices of both cotton and textile increasing along with uh, finding alternative trading partners and then uh, vietnam cotton industry benefited even more um, and um, uh, with lower, um, as textile export of China increased with lower tariff and China continued to import more cotton from Vietnam. So this research was supported by the Georgia Cotton Commission and thank you and suggestions, comments, feedbacks are highly welcomed. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Um Anybody has any questions? Oh, sorry, my video, of course. Uh, if anybody has uh, any questions, you can uh, write it in the chat or we're with a small group, so I could also just say it, I think. Um, otherwise, I, I will uh, start it off. I have a, a, a question. Uh, it's a great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was a little bit unclear, though, is about, about the um, about the order of the of the scenarios, if you uh, if you did every scenario uh, completely separate, all all based on the same base year, or if you there were some uh, there were there, there was some scenarios were done first, and then the output of those were used as input for the other scenarios. So, this, about that. so for this um, again, this this is in a very uh, beginning phase. So right now we are just using the same base data to see what would be the effect on. Uh, each cases, uh, but that that is uh, something that we are looking for. Like we are trying to see the impact on uh, impact before the trade deal, and then use that data to uh, see the impact after the trade deal. So that is our uh, next step of the study. But as of now, we are using the same base. Okay. Because yeah, it would be very interesting to see, you know, if these. Um if these uh, increased trade flows from from say the US to to v Vietnam as a uh, as reaction to the China tariffs if they if they stay or uh, how much do they remain then once the tariffs are lifted or as the as the as the trade work sort of continued uh, how how uh, how much do those effects stay okay uh, thank you. Uh, um some new questions are also coming in um from uh, Mike Bourne he says uh, thank you uh, this this seems like very important work I was wondering about your elasticities of substitution. Is cotton a relatively homogenous good, regardless of where it comes from? How about processed textiles? Um, I I think I can answer the second part of the question. And Dr. Jing, if you have any suggestion on the first elasticities of substitution part. Uh, so again, um, cotton is not a, a homogenous product when it comes to origin, different origin. But what we are taking into consideration on this one is, um, uh, especially for the data update part, we are looking for uh, the HS5201 uh, so that we can have a homogeneous uh, cotton uh, commodity when we are doing the simulation. Uh, and uh, in case of textile, uh, we have a lot of um, different option that uh, textiles use. So uh, as I mentioned, only um, some of the textiles use cotton, and then we have other um, different alternatives as well. Uh, so this this is not a homogeneous word, but Dr. Jing, do, do, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, thank you, Mike, for uh, the question. So I think this, the Somehow the Lee's presentation kind of motivated us a little bit more <laughs> on this project because this one is fairly new. Uh, we started a month ago and the, the main point of uh, this paper was to look at some like sort of spillover effect to the other trade partners uh, rather than just the US and China. Those are in the war directly. Uh, so for the model, uh, part, we are using kind of the standard uh, GTAP model without adjusting any of the parameters, in, uh, including the um, like Armington uh, or I, uh, I'm what uh, I'm guessing you mentioned the last as a substitution. Uh, 
and maybe the substitution between domestic and uh, uh, treated goods or the um, elasticity of substitution um, in the, for example, the production of a textile, if it use any of cotton as the, uh, like a, the secondary inputs. So I'm guessing you are mentioning one of them or both? Uh, thanks. No, I, th I think you've answered my question. It was just about the art and mm -hmm. is really and the extent to which cotton oh. and also uh, textiles, you know, from Vietnam are different to cotton and textiles from, from other sources. But I guess that's reflected in the in the Arlington elasticity. No, uh, yeah, they are separate, of course. I think Yang Xuan, uh, she might be able to answer the like the 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 question about the good itself. But in terms of the uh, the parameters, I guess um, so. Currently, we don't differentiate it, the different types of cotton that is used in the textile production. Well, uh, what Lee has done, like uh, uh, can breaking uh, commodities into two different types, or uh, allow like uh, um, this uh, same industry to use different products, kind of uh, give us a little more idea of how we can uh, further differentiate the different uh, cotton as the uh, inputs or. Yeah, it's it's kind of a vague in my mind right now, but uh, uh, I think there's something more we can do definitely. So I will I let Yang Xuan to answer uh, uh, more about how the uh, different types of cotton can be used in terms of uh, uh, next stage of production in the textile. Yang Xuan. Um. Yeah. So for cotton um product or uh, cotton fiber, there's a difference. Um, between cotton producing from different countries, uh, U.S. Australia are uh, in general recognize a high, well, high value um, or high quality cotton producing countries. Uh, India and China they produce a lot of cotton, but the cotton fiber quality is recognized as lower than the U.S. and Australia cotton. So it, even though cotton is quite, um, quite homogeneous good, but in terms of using by the textile uh, industry, they will use they they will pick and choose according to the um, the product they want to produce, and they will pick and choose between different um, sources of the cotton to meet their um, demand for the fiber quality. So there is uh, some differences, and definitely I think um, the next step we could approach for this research or maybe future research. Is to study the Armington elasticity or Armington factor to show um, the different sources from different country for the cotton fiber. Yeah, I do see like um, sometimes when I purchase like uh, cotton uh, textile stuff, uh, you see this Pima cotton or some fancy cotton um, we can buy from the market, but uh, the original. Of the material comes from Peru or some other countries, though that kind of a, a different standard to recognize the product as a higher end with a better quality. I think that uh, has some differentiation in the market, uh, but uh, I guess like what Lee did and in your work, uh, we need to gather some additional information about the market share of each different kind of product and. Uh, maybe also um, some uh, uh, additional information in terms of the uh, inputs, like uh, what kind of uh, 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 textile is using how much percent of the uh, different type of cotton, uh, depending on the data, I think, Yang Xuan. Yeah. And thank you uh, for the question. It's very intriguing and help us uh, think about further <laughs> of the next step. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Um, if there are, if there are any more questions for uh, for uh, Shweta or or um, in fact we have a, a few more minutes because we were very efficient in the in the transitions between presentations. 
if there are uh, any questions for the other presenters, um, we, can have, we still can have a few minutes of discussion. And otherwise, we can uh, continue this uh, via email and, and, and offline. I, um, I want to thank everybody for, for, for their uh, wonderful presentations and for the, for the feedback and, and, and questions and the great discussions. And uh, see you guys uh, at another session, I'm sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good nice work. To see you all. Yeah.